This is an Anglican priest conducting the service of Holy Communion. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created. This is also an Anglican priest conducting the exact same service using the same prayer book, using the same altar. The differences you see come from something deeper than individual preferences. Instead, they come from theological differences found between Anglicans that define us as Protestants and Catholics. Anglicans carry a diverse range of beliefs when it comes to theology in liturgy, piety, and spirituality that we call churchmanship. This is in part because we define ourselves as being both Catholic and Protestant. As such, there are differences between those emphasizing our Catholicism and those emphasizing our Protestantism. Those emphasizing our Catholicism are called High Church, and those emphasizing our Protestantism are called Low Church. The effects of churchmanship can best be seen in the celebration of the Eucharist, which is the most central act of Christian worship. I've asked two priests to help me show you these differences. I'll start by introducing you to Father Nick Trussell. What's, what's this title all about? No, it doesn't need to be Father Nick, just Nick is fine. Uh, my business card says Reverend Nick, that's okay too. <laughs> so is that better? Yeah, yeah, that'll work. Thanks. <laughs> oh, he's very low church. He's very low church. Next, I'll introduce you what, to... What's this? Father and the Reverend Canon. You correct that. Jeez. This is the Reverend Canon Travis Enright. Let us pray. Most merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you created humanity in the Travis is high church. Now, you might not think that these two priests get along at all with one being high church and one being low church. And you would be dead wrong. They get along just fine. Now, there are some differences you'll easily be able to spot between Nick and Travis. The first difference is going to be with the vestments they are wearing. Travis first puts on an amas to cover his neck, followed by an ankle length surplus which he has secured with a signature around his waist. He will then put on a stole formed as a yoke on his front, followed by putting on a chasuble. Now, Travis's mode of dress is quite typical of high church priests. You'll see that Nick is not wearing a chasuble at all and does not have a stole formed as a yoke. Today, this can be very typical of low church priests. However, until the 20th century, a low church priest wouldn't have even worn this. Typically, you would have seen the priest don an ankle-length Cossack, followed by an English-style surplus, and a tippet, commonly called a preaching scarf. To this day, a number of low church priests will still vest themselves like this. So, why does Travis wear it and Nick doesn't? Why do I wear it? it nothing makes me closer to me understanding it's not about me than the chess. But I think uh, when he puts it on, he's putting on um, a, a physical manifestation of the, not only the office of, of priest, uh, but the, the prayers that are coming from that gathered community, even through history, uh, that, that it is the most holy prayer shawl that one could wear uh, while making uh, that, that special Eucharistic prayer. I think he thinks it's uh, ceremonial. I think he wears it because I think it's um, pretentious. Uh, because I, I kind of at times feel it's a bit pretentious. Uh, and I feel like I'm putting on uh, a costume or, or a poncho that, that I don't have personal uh, attachment or, or buy into it. The next thing I'll cover is the altar setup itself, and the differences here are pretty easy to spot. First, you'll notice that Travis has candles placed on the altar and a sterling silver cross on the redutos to his back. As well, he has a server at his side to turn the pages for him on the missile. Conversely, you'll see that Nick has left the veil and burst on the altar with him. 
When it comes to preparing the altar itself, both priests are relatively similar on how they set up. You'll see that Nick will take a linen called the corporal out of the burst and places it off to the side, removing the veil and folding it. Then the pall, and then finally the patent, a top from the chalice before going to get the bread and wine. However, Travis diverges from Nick and takes part in a ritual cleansing by having a server wash his fingertips by pouring water over them into a bowl called a lavaba bowl. So, why does Travis use the lavabo bowl and Nick doesn't? I find the lavabo um, just adds a little extra bit of complication to what's happening as we prepare the table. Uh, and again, I don't find a, a valuable girding in, in spirit or in prayer. Through Travis the uses the lavabo bowl uh, for um, purity, right? To be, uh, to be washed in a way um, and yeah so that that's what he uses it for to come to again that that most holy of prayer in the holiest state that he can be in and the lavabo bowl is a, a sign of that after a prayer over the gifts the eucharist properly begins with a sursum corda which is latin for lift up your hearts both travis and nick are using the exact same eucharistic prayer the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our God. thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God. For you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us. You opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel. And through your servants Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage to freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. With them and with all your saints, who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. So, what's up with their hands? Uh, your hands is particular. I'm very, very particular about the way my posturing is in, in the celebration um, because, probably because I am a liturgist. I definitely want to lift up the, the prayer. I think the Oran's position is important uh, to me as I celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, but I, I don't want to get too fancy. Uh, so, so they usually just end up staying there or uh, in front of me or on the, on the table when they are not. Right, but if you do it in a particular way, a reverent way, right? And then it's not about, oh, he moved his hands this particular way, you know, like, like this, or randomly, it's not thought of, just blah. Then I think, uh, then people start looking about, it's about the performance then, about um, what is really fundamentally happening in that body of blood. The next portion of the prayer is the Sanctus and the Benedictus. power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So, What's with the sign of the cross, or the lack thereof? Oh, Travis makes the sign of the cross, I think, 10,000 times during the Eucharistic prayer. Really, Nick? Really? 10,000 times? I, I only do it once, and, and actually the sign of the cross that I, that I uh, that's not true, I make it twice. Twice, Travis? Really? All right, tell you what, we'll keep count from now on, and he's got one so far. And, uh because it's, it is the right and holy thing to do, <laughs> and it's part of, his, uh, part of his tradition. Well, I think I do it in the Sanctus, because most people, most low church people, don't bow during the Sanctus. That's the more important part, because that bowing the son of the Sanctus is referencing back to Isaiah when all the eyes were covered, and the, 
our fear and trembling, right, is should be that this God, this creator, is in our midst. And even the sight of him burns our face off, you know. And and the you know, when I cross myself is actually the fact that God allows us in Jesus Christ, right? The one that, that in the second part of that allows us to stand holy, right, and upright in in the presence of God. Um, I, I I forget. It's just not been part of, of my practice as as a as a priest. So and I think one of the things that low church people do, if they don't know why, if they can't intellectually come up with a reason for it, they choose not to do it. So I think that the low church is much more cognizant of modernity, of, 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 of the intellectual understanding of knowing why one does things. Next comes the institutional narrative. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick, and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. So, why is Travis nodding his head and Nick isn't nodding his head when saying Jesus Christ? Um, because he's a, a wonderful, pious man. That's that's why. Uh, no, it's an important part of the ritual. Again, um, it's it's part of that that dance of liturgy. To during that prayer, when you say Jesus, you nod your head. So he does. <laughs> I think it's because it's really, and when a priest tries to make it about themselves, that small act of no, really, it's about Jesus. So every time, every knee and every head should bow when that word is spoken. That is, that is how powerful that word should be in our life. <laughs> I never know when to nod my head. <laughs> he probably sees the, the fullness of the ceremony as one encompassing piece. And, that's, and it's, the reverence is in itself, not a particular point in, to be revered. So I made a decision a long time ago. I don't have to do it. It's not. Uh, I I can love Christ without nodding my head or or, or making a bow or or crossing myself every time I say His name. So I'll just not do that. Next comes the words of institution. On the night He freely gave Himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when He had given thanks to you, He broke it and gave it to His disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Now, the amenesis and oblation. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroyed the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ, has, Christ died. has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Finally concluding with the epiclesis and doxology. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection and looking for his coming again in glory. We offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, the living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. What does Travis move his hands during the epiclesis and Nick does not. It, I guess it's a personal preference thing, but for some it's very important that they see the hands go over and uh, the elements and, and as though I, I worry about it being holy hand waving or uh, becoming something magical rather than something mystical. Yeah, so that well, why would I do this? Right? Why do I put my hands over top of it? Um, because I think there's a locality. Locality is very important in everything that we do. It's not the fact a man named Jesus, right, who, who lived in Palestine. It is this man, born of Mary and Joseph, made real, made manifest, was chosen. And it's that locality that, that God resided in a particular woman and uh, was raised by a particular man. And the Holy Spirit entered in a particular uh, moment in time. And that is what we're called to remember, the particularity of the, the whole um, road from, you know, from Nazareth to Golgotha. After the distribution of consecrated bread and wine to the faithful, Travis conducts ablutions, where he will ensure that his fingertips have been cleaned of all particulates of bread, and that the chalice has been cleared of consecrated wine. Why does Travis conduct the ablutions and Nick does not? I personally don't want people to be confused about whom they're worshipping. Probably because it, the Eucharist isn't finished until the ablutions have been done. Uh, that there is still uh, feeding and nourishment to be happen or to happen for that community and in the course of that that active prayer in, in the ablutions. And I do believe that God rests completely in the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and in that Eucharist. He's completely there. Um, it doesn't take away its breadness or its wineness though. Um, well I I sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um, again, it's not for me, not uh, an essential part of the, the ritual, the tradition. It depends on, on where I am in the, in the context of that. Uh, often it doesn't get done at churches I've been in uh, until after, so it's just kind of a, a time saving thing that. Given how different they each conduct the service, what is the Eucharist to Nick and Travis? That's a huge question. Um, because it, because it, it, it's central, so so central. But uh, Eucharist means Thanksgiving, right? And we get together to give thanks for the, the work of God in Christ and in our midst. Uh, but obviously there's more than that. Uh, there's entering into that um, presence of God in a new way. I think he values it, but not the same, probably not the way that I would value it. I think he values it as something that the, the, the congregation needs as something, as a remembering, literally remembering the word in their lives, remembering what it means for uh, the scriptural components of that. Of that. Uh, it, it's probably the, the deepest uh, liturgical expression that we could do week by week, um, and, and maybe second only to, to baptism as the height of uh, sacrament. The breaking of, uh, of our, our sinful nature and God uh, residing in a, a place where we can, when we, when we experience the Eucharist, we experience God breaking into our sinful nature. 
when we experience uh, taking the body and the blood of Christ holy and um, in all its components, we are transformed in that moment of, to, a sin, to a, a sin-free state. Even just for that millisecond where God rests on our tongues and where our created nature meets the Creator in, in the fullness of, of, of the body, who we are as people, and in the body of who God is as, uh, as our God. For Travis, too, what he has taught me about the Eucharist is what it means to take uh, Jesus into ourselves uh, in those elements of the bread and the wine. Uh, not only knowing that, that of course, they're, they're blessed or they're consecrated, set aside for God's special purpose, uh, but to have Christ's own spirit within us through those elements is a, a deeply holy thing. And um, yeah, though we uh, outwardly exercise the Eucharist a bit differently, I think we uh, inwardly are definitely given the this, this same spirit and understanding through it. Finally, how did Nick and Travis view each other as priests? It's not the high churchness that makes Travis less of a priest. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. No, definitely not. Uh, the, being high church doesn't make him less of a priest, and I wouldn't say being high church makes him more of a priest either. It... Who is the better priest? He is. Um, because I think, um, yeah, I really do. Uh, I like to think that we learn a lot from each other, and uh, that both of us are better priests for that. No, because his ordination, even though he may not understand his own ontology, but he, he has been fundamentally changed at his priesthood. And it doesn't matter how he practices it, if he practices it you know, well or not. He, he was changed. And, and it... In the end, most low church and high church priests put aside their differences and give praise to God. You are a God. We praise you. You are the Lord. We acclaim you. You are the Eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. In the end, there is mutual respect and friendship where conflict need not be. Yeah.